Hey, how's it going, guys? We are getting ready to go live here. My name is Randall Stroud. Had to get a cup of coffee there. Let me just adjust my camera, get everything set up. Today, we're going to have a very special guest. His name is Raphael Samuel. If you don't know anything about him, he's a very interesting guy. I'm waiting for him to go into the chat here. Just a second. So I've invited him into the chat. going to have to edit this later. <laughs> We have Mr. Raphael Samuel has just joined in. Try to get him. So, let's see here. Yo, what? The All right. I think, hey, we have you in here. So, what we're going to do now and later, we're going to edit this video and, and trim it down whatnot, uh, just that very beginning part, but we're just going to do some quick introdu introductions of ourselves and just have a very friendly uh, conversation slash debate, whatever you want to call it, and just trade some ideas and let the audience make up their own minds. Sounds so good. I'll start off with myself. Uh, my name is Randall Stroud, and my background, I've worked as a paralegal, private investigator. I grew up in a family that did martial arts and boxing. I grew up in a very multicultural uh, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My mother had me in, in the church, uh, but at one point in my life, I was actually training to be a Buddhist monk. I know it's kind of crazy. I had a lot of Cambodian kids that grew up in my neighborhood, spent a lot of time with them. Right. Um, I've written several books on uh, divorce, spirituality, relationships, all kinds of topics. So. Right. I have a very open mind, a very diverse background of ideas and philosophies, but um, tell us, for anyone who's not familiar with you or your work, I know I came across you because I was going through a very hard time about two years ago, mm -hmm. and you know I just went through a breakup with a girl, and she nice. really wanted to have children, and I was kind of you know, sitting back, I was like, ah, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that I'm ready right now. And I was thinking about all of the, the hurdles in modern society when it comes to having children. It yeah. isn't like 10,000, it isn't like 10,000 years ago when you had all these villages that were sort of together and helping one <laughs> another, you know, now, nowadays we live in a society where everything has a number or a price tag attached to it. And, right. and then whenever you have, and whenever you have a child, 
that child is literally taking food out of your mouth, you mm -hmm. know? And if you, and if you don't have the resources to take care of it, now both of you are suffering and both of you are struggling to stay alive. And that's the case for a lot of people is having a child or even going through a divorce. Divorce mm -hmm. rates are so high in the United oh, States. Yeah. You have a lot of men out here, especially that are paying alimony and child support. And if they can't make these payments, they go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, and then, you know, we have all these dating apps, you know, cheating is so common. So having relationships just from the emotional side and then in modern capitalism, it is so expensive to even have one child, much less a big family. So, you know, I came across you because I was looking for answers, right? Mm -hmm. And I came across your philosophies not saying that I agree with everything that you say, but you are a very intelligent guy. You do make a lot of arguments that are worth mentioning. But the number one thing that intrigued me was this guy actually sued his parents for giving birth to him. So tell us a little bit about your process and, and how this happened and how this came to be. For, for anyone who isn't familiar with you, just give us a breakdown of who you are and how you came to prominence. Right. So uh, my name is Rafael Samuel. Uh, I live in India, uh, currently in Goa. And uh, for many, I, like I was born and brought up in Bombay, essentially, Mumbai. And uh, so it, I was always against life in, in, at, at various ages and at various levels. I was against life and I didn't believe in the idea of, uh, you know, I didn't agree. I didn't understand why someone would bring someone else to life, you know, and, and more than that, worse than that, I didn't understand why we are here. Because everyone seemed to be just eating and working and eating and working, the same nonsense. So I just kept, this sort of exploded in my mind over time, you know, and I kept asking questions, asking questions, and I couldn't get answers. And uh, one day it just sort of struck, uh, like I went through a lot and, you know, uh, through my life. And I basically it was me trying to search for answers, you know, and the basic answer was, what should I do? Like, why should I do anything, if at all? And then one day it just struck me that there is nothing to do, you know, and from there, the entire thing just sort of came uh, out that, you know, firstly, there is nothing to do. Secondly, uh, there is no reason to have, have children. There is no, it's just biological process, processes at work. And even if it's um, God or whatever, whatever, it doesn't seem that we are, we are achieving anything. We just seem to be a mistake, you know, and it's possible that even God, for that matter, is just a child making mistakes. So all this happened. And then I started this. Uh, I, I put on this beard. I put on the, the, the specs. And I just started talking online, you know, uh, and I would do this in college and my uh, people in college told me, okay, it's, it's probably time that, uh, you know, you do this. They kept telling me over the years. And then it is, I started in 2018 and in 2019, a reporter just randomly called me and I, I didn't even give it to a, a thought. I, I just told her stuff. And I, by then I had like three, 400 followers and she just put it online and it just blew from there on. So it's interesting. It's interesting to know that uh, people, you know, uh, consider this question so important, whereas I didn't, frankly, like it was it was a dinner table talk at my house. And for them, it was like, wow, revolutionary, you've questioned my existence and all that nonsense. So I was like, cool, that's great. Like whatever the any any way, the, it does not matter to me, but whatever the way, as long as you're aware, I'm happy, you know. So that sort of happened. And then from there on, I started with other philosophies, how to be happy in life, how to chill, how to enjoy you know, and the, and the need to not do anything. I think the main thing that kills us is the need to do something, you know, and uh, first we have this need and then society adds to this need, pushing you to do something when you don't really want to do much, you know. So that's that. Yeah, that's me, basically. Now, and I understand a lot of these, you know, philosophies that you're speaking of. Um, some people might call it nihilism, mm -hmm. where the philosophy of inherently everything is meaningless, pointless, and without any sort of value. Right. Would you subscribe to that ideology or philosophy of nihilism? Well, not exactly. It's, it's slightly more complicated than that. Uh, when, you, when you see nihilism and all that, I mean, uh, the best way to describe what I feel is nihilism. Uh, you know, the, just the simple pointlessness of everything that's happening around. Uh, but it, it, it's much more complicated than that. And I've been like uh, churning out videos with different philosophies related to that. And it's more like nihilism is more like, you know, give up in a way. But I'm more, uh, let's say, on the existentialist side saying that now that you're here, might as well have some fun. 
you know and that that okay. sort of frees you so yeah but basically nihilism yes i that's why the name nihil anand okay now uh <laughs> getting to the main point of how you became an anti natalist or you know for anyone who doesn't know these terms you know a natalist is someone who you know has children sees nothing wrong with it but an anti natalist is someone who's inherently against you know creating life or bringing life into this world right how did you re- how did you reach the point of where you said i'm going to sue my parents for giving birth to me as you say without my consent how did this come to be was this something that you seriously wanted to take action for or is this just a publicity stunt or what was you know how did this come to be right so initially it was it was not even a publicity stunt it was just a thought in my mind and it was something that i discussed with my parents and you know and with a few other anti natalists that i met online and then one of them caught that phrase and then they sort of uh, told everyone like they told the reporters at that time we were promoting a thing called child free india and uh, we were trying to get reporters to cover us you know and it was a little difficult at that point so she told one of the reporters that this guy wants to sue his parents and the reporter apparently thought it was a big thing and when that happened i realized okay this probably can change the world like uh, you know when it blew up so uh, the idea i frankly i was not really thinking about it as a great idea i just thought it as a very obvious thing that you know uh, if they've given me birth why don't they just pay for my shit like why should i um, why should i pay bills i didn't ask for this why should i live why should i work why should i do things i don't want to do so that thought sort of entered into and then it became you know i'm going to sue my parents but it was not i don't want i don't actually want money for them i'm happy with my life and i can do whatever i want but i want to make a point here that if i can sue my parents if me who someone who's happy with them and you know who's happy with life can is dissatisfied with life what about someone who's abused hit you know uh, or has gone through a lot or uh, maybe they they should be they should get that right so i wanted to do it nominally so that there's a precedent uh, when other kids can do that you know where other kids can sort of uh, sue their parents on this basis that was the so, idea so so in your heart deep down did you really want to win this case against your parents or was this just a way to open up the conversation for the public right so um it was both actually uh, i i didn't want to hurt my parents in any way that's for sure uh, i just wanted to make a point here that uh, you know when people start talking about it like uh, see everything great okay has started with something absurd and when you start with that absurdity like for example your martin luther uh, the monk he went on uh, he went to the church uh, this and he he uh, put up 95 requests right and yeah, there you and, there. yeah and that that's sorry that's when uh, the uh, renaissance started basically so uh, something absurd has to happen for something new to come so it was just right. it was just that it was just the idea of absurdity where people sort of um, come where people sort of start discussing it and then they come up with their own opinions absolutely like i don't expect anyone to agree with me 100% but sure, it was sure. more about and, creating the conversation and now you you describe yourself as you know as an atheist is that correct oh uh, no i'm actually uh, if you go to see it's agnostic i'll tell you why because okay agnostic okay yeah because okay. Uh, the, the idea of whether to believe or disbelieve in god does not really matter it's it's about what you know and you don't know and the fact is none of us know for sure but but but, but you lean towards there not being a god correct oh uh, yeah a, a, a little bit because okay. it doesn't okay. seem to be at least the way he's described uh, definitely not okay well we'll 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 unpack that a little bit later but but going back to this this lawsuit here what was your main legal argument going into this case you know why do you think that you had a case that was that was right okay so uh, every basically every contract is based on consent right and it's based on the fact that uh someone uh they've had the child i mean oh sorry uh, they it's based on it's based on two parties but in india what happens like i'm talking now very specifically indian law here uh the the male child especially has certain obligations towards the parents okay and uh, even after 18 especially when uh, if the parents are old or they can't earn he has to pay, he has to pay them he has to pay them an allowance so my question was simple i did not sign this contract i did not ask to be your son okay and i did not uh, ask to come here at all 
how can you make me work like this so this is this was the legal question here you know that uh, i don't want to take care of them what uh, are we some kind of investment are we you know slaves what are we what was my basic question to the law and and if you if we say like if the law says that you know uh okay maybe like if you if the law says that we cannot give you money your parents cannot give you money so i'm like okay give me death like uh, you don't want them to give me money so let me let me euthanize myself you know okay well, wow well that's another conversation yeah, as well <laughs> <laughs> uh you know that right there could be a whole conversation and we might dig into that a bit but going into your legal argument so you say that because you were not given consent to be born and yes when you are born certain obligations and responsibilities are eventually thrusted upon you pretty early on in life you know right. by the time that you're old enough to walk and talk your parents expect you to go to bed at a certain time to right. you know help out with house chores and and different things but here here's my question and this is a question that a lot of people have is how could they have given you such consent mm -hmm. before you were born you know so what is your response to that right so the response is quite simple see if an animal does it i understand because an animal is not as conscious as we are but uh, as as far as my parents are concerned especially where they are educated you know where they have some sort of this uh, my question is that if there is a girl who cannot give her consent if she's drunk or you know whatever will you still do it will you still uh, you know go proceed she's she's been given you signs all evening but now she's too drunk will you still go ahead with it so if you are that immoral then you don't deserve to be parents so my question is very simple if you cannot take consent do not do it simple okay well are you familiar with the legal term mens rea yes intention okay y yes your intention or the quote unquote guilty mind mm -hmm. would you would you possibly agree that your parents because they were raised in a in a world or a society where it's normal to have children and they were quote unquote indoctrinated to believe that that's normal and then their parents were raised the same way and so on and so forth mm -hmm. it, it it would appear to me that they they didn't have a guilty mind you know they didn't create you with the mindset that yes he's going to have some sort of you know miserable life or or he's going to have some kind of pain that he's going to experience or or that he's going to not want to be born because there are people who are certainly grateful to have been born mhm mm so how how do you address that that legal principle of of mens rea and the guilty mind or not unless your parents have told you something that I don't know where they said yes we gave birth to you because we were purposely going to give you some trouble mhm mm right so uh that, that i agree with your mens rea point uh that uh, you know most parents i'm pretty sure most parents want the best for their children and uh that is probably the reason they would have but the, there are deeper reasons here and that is what i wanted to delve in uh, into more than mens rea mens rea i understand and i totally understand my parents having a child at that time uh you know uh, not understanding what it was my mother says very clearly that if i if neil anand was there at that time i would not have had children you know so uh, i totally get that but uh, the idea is to create that awareness now especially with this generation with the way the world is burning and the half the world is burning and half the world is drowning uh with that and we we have food shortages and we have economic bubbles and what not so right now is the time to create a precedent for a future set of thought that was the this my my, my mensri as far as my parents are concerned i totally get it now i will agree with you on that okay is that if you're in a situation that is just totally horrible you know it, it's you and another person and you're basically living in human feces and you're poor mm -hmm. and you know you know that if you give birth to a child mm -hmm. that they're going to be born completely into suffering but this wasn't the case for you for you you know both of your parents are are lawyers i assume that they mm -hmm. have you know a good salary and things right. like that that you know i'm i'm going to assume and correct me if i'm wrong or if you don't want to talk about it we can change mm -hmm. the subject but i'm assuming that your parents didn't you know beat you uh rape you abuse mm -hmm. you or any of these sort of things right right 
yeah so that so, that is exactly my point you know uh, as i said in the beginning there is someone like me can have a problem with life then why not someone who you know uh, who is actually beaten raped or uh, you know I, of course there are different there are separate procedures for that but uh, the the indian legal system and the indian social system is very pro slavery in the sense of they actually believe that their children owe them everything firstly uh, a lot of them considering menstrual uh, considering the menstrual argument if you see a lot of them actually have children so that the children can live the dreams that they didn't so that they can make money for when they are old so it's called in our language is called budhape ki lati literally the stick when you're old the stick that you use to walk when you're old is your child okay and it's normally the son so uh, Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that is my point. That if I can be born who has no issues with life, but I have see the thing is I have no problems in life. I have a problem with life. You understand? So it's just like why am I? What am I doing here? So the, if someone has actual problems in life, if I sue my parents for say fifty thousand rupees, okay, which is about a thousand dollars, or maybe someone else can sue it for you know ten uh, lakhs or fifteen lakhs, whatever, like which is about twenty thirty thousand dollars. So, so someone just said in the comments here that no no one suffers by not coming into the world. So right. but by not being born it's guaranteed that nothing bad is going to happen to you. But you know a lot of people would argue on the contrary that by being born you are also guaranteed to have at least one or two pleasurable experiences. And for me personally mm-hmm. and th- this is not a slide against you or anyone else but I have had a a pretty difficult life, you know. Uh, a year ago, I survived a gunshot wound to the head. Wow! You know, I, I was uh, I was walking home after a night out on the town, and mm-hmm. there was these two guys that belonged to this racist religious group called the Black Hebrew Israelites, and they okay. believe that white people and Asians can't go to heaven. You know, it's okay. a really weird ideology. And okay. I grew up in the church. I grew mm-hmm. up in the church, and I, I started trading all these Bible verses, and we're arguing. And a guy in the audience didn't like what was being said. Okay. And he he shot a gun eight times. Wow. And uh, the the first bullet scraped the back of my head, and it hit this sign that these guys were holding, and it put mm-hmm. a bullet hole through it. Right. And it, it was really it was really crazy because the last thing that I said was a, a Bible verse. What Jesus mm-hmm. says is that. No man on this earth, no man is good but God. And as soon as I said that, the gun went off, scraped the back of my head, hit this sign, and then seven other people got hit and had to go to the hospital. And I'm wow. just standing there with a with a scratch on my head. And you know what happened to me in that in that moment? Because this was like a year ago, and last year, like a lot of people, because of the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, I was having money problems. Uh, Me and my girlfriend had just broke up. Uh, like my life was really just going down so bad. Mm-hmm. But after that happened, I instantly reflected back uh-huh. to my life of all the amazing things that happened to me. And and I really think that throughout our lives, whether it's just eating something delicious or or kissing a girl for the first time that you really like, or mm-hmm. even just going for a walk, all of these right. little simple things. Are actually such miracles because you have to think. In order for you to be born, mm. your parents had to meet each other, right? Yeah. And there's there's eight there's eight billion people approximately on Earth. Your mm. parents had to meet each other, mm. and then your father had to deposit you know millions and millions of sperm cells in your mom, and then one of those had to implant. I mean, I don't have to give you a biology lesson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, of course, of course. But 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 it is an absolute miracle. That you were even born to begin with, and then plus you survived into adulthood, and mm-hmm. then somehow or another, somehow or another, you and I started talking, mm-hmm. and we and we live on opposite sides of the globe. Mm-hmm. I'm in the United States in the morning. You're in mm-hmm. Mumbai, India, mm-hmm. and we're here talking to each other. And I'm so glad and happy that we are because even though we have some some cultural, religious, and philosophical differences. Right. I mean, I, I I feel very lucky to have even met you. So right now, this isn't a scientific argument. You know, how does that disprove anything that I'm saying? But my challenge to you is maybe, and, and this is where we can agree. Mm-hmm. I think that perhaps maybe you have more of a problem with 
society itself rather than the act of creating a child. And, and I'll go into that a little bit more later, mm-hmm. specifically about the child. But I will agree with you that mm-hmm. we live in a society now where everything is a commodity. You know, right. if we go back, if we go back five, 10,000 years ago, yes, we were less comfortable. We didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have cell mm-hmm. phones. We didn't have, we right. didn't have a lot of comforts, but we were a part of this tribe. And as soon as you were born, you kind of knew that you were going to be born into a village that was going to look out for you. But mm-hmm. now we live in this, uh, what I call crony capitalism or corrupt capitalist society, where right. as soon as you're born and you reach this age, whether it's 17, 18, just depends on the country. As soon as you're old enough to work, mm-hmm. you're expected to just, okay, you know, go out there and make it on your own. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and and I don't necessarily like that society where you can get married and then someone can say, hey, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. And then all of a sudden half of your stuff is gone and then you have to pay maintenance payments to an ex-spouse or, mm-hmm. you know, you, you get old and you start to get sick and mm-hmm. you can't work. And then now you can't afford your rent and you're getting evicted and now you're homeless. Mm, and right. we're all basically slaves to these <laughs> careers that are really kind of pointless. Most people would rather be uh, at home with their families or their girlfriend or their dog or or uh, like our ancestors thousands of years ago, right. just being out in nature and hunting and, and, uh, and gathering things. But we're stuck in some office cubicle slaving mm. for some multimillion dollar company making, you know, pennies on the dollar and then we're going to these you know and then at the end of the day we're going back home to these these shitty flats or apartments as we call them in america mm-hmm. and then we're like we're basically slaves to these to these careers that really just uh control yeah, every again. aspect of, of your life where even if you want to take a day off from work you have to beg mm-hmm. some manager can yeah. I please have a day off from work oh i'm sorry mm-hmm. you don't have any personal uh pto vacation time Sorry, you have to come into work anyways. We're, we're right. basically slaves to this this modern machine or system. So given the current climate, mm-hmm. yes, I can absolutely agree with you that uh, even though I'm not against having children as you are, I would agree with you that if you are going to have a child, you definitely need to consider what they're being born into and what the plan is to raise them through that challenges. I mean, because – and I'll let you chime in here in just a moment. But I met a young man a, cu- a couple of weeks ago. And in, in the United States, one in four children grow up in a single parent home without a father. I met right. this young guy who was probably in his early 20s. He was broke down on the side of the road with a mm-hmm. flat tire, and he didn't know how to change it. He said, mm-hmm. oh, my dad never taught me how to you know, change a tire. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that the, the parents that we have, especially these days coming up, in the United States, we have two generations of parents that were our kids that were raised by single mothers. Mm-hmm. So you have all these people being born without necessary life skills. And then we make fun of them and say, oh, why are you not able to survive in society when they didn't even have parents to give them the, the basic skills mm-hmm. to be able to be successful in the first place? Right. So going back, and, and this is where I'm going to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. You said that you're against being born because your consent wasn't asked for. So does right. that also mean that you're against abortion because a fetus couldn't ask for consent to be killed? So I know, uh, see, I'm pro, firstly, I'm pro euthanasia. So it's not even a question of abortion. If, if a woman, as far as abortion is concerned, uh, to me, a woman is, a sim- it's, it's an extension of a woman's body. It's, it's essentially like a... Uh, it's a part of her body, but it's like an organ. Okay. And if she wants to remove it, let her remove it because it is most uh, like at least till four or five months. It's just a clump of cells. It's not even life. You know, that way uh, exfoliating could be considered a crime because that's also a clump of cells. Right. Now your question about uh, most people are whether most people are happy or, you know, or whether the parents are bad and whether society is bad. Yes. Society and bad parents have exacerbated the problem. 
but we are thinking human beings that is the main issue and when the sheer fact that we are thinking we should look at life completely which is very difficult for most people to do i completely understand but you have to create that awareness now we are a living lack okay we feel hungry we feel bored okay we don't know what to do we get confused so whoever you are the richest man on earth the most fulfilled man on earth you are going to go through these uh, tri- uh, tribulations they are essentially pointless and if you're not here like you're saying you know you're talking about pleasure you're saying that there are pleasurable moments yes that's the whole point there are pleasurable moments but is it worth all the nonsense we go through you know is it worth like i'll tell you a story uh, there was this rockefeller or one of the really rich uh, this and they had a son and they had only one son and they wanted to protect that son you know throughout like they were, they really took care of the child and they had nannies for him and the parents were also there for him very unusual for a rich kid um and you know everyone was there and they kept him in the compound and they had made an entire playground inside the compound he was that rich okay and one day he was just curious to go out and the, they would never allow him never allow him and one day by mistake somebody left the gate open and he just ran out and died in the uh, died on the street right so even someone that rich the question is your parents will always screw you up at some level something is going to lack something is going to be um not okay for you you know so we are a living lack and we are always most of us are unhappy at some point in time we are always trying to reach homeostasis and i made a video the other day uh, that even when everything is all right you know and most of us are in a state state of homeostasis nowadays because we've reached this level of civilization where we have the air conditioner where we have a house where everything is good you know uh, we've reached this level but our brains need more trouble you know they want more trouble why is that because in the bush if you're silent if you're chilling you're in danger and that's what your brain thinks that's what your body thinks so even there you're a living lack you know where you are chilling but suddenly your brain gets bored why is it bored because it's searching for predators and now it doesn't know what to do in a state of homeostasis so the the thing is it's not about what you have or how what society has done the point here is to think go above being an animal okay and look at life as it is so that that's it and oh one more one more very important point that you put you said the, the chances of us being here see at some point in time at some point in history considering the number of things that are happening in the universe you and i would have met okay and you and i would have talked and we would have been born and etc etc it's like saying uh, there there's a puddle right if the if a, if the if, a, if water falls into a puddle and it suddenly gets conscious the water gets conscious and it looks at the puddle and says wow this puddle fits me perfectly you know and maybe what are the chances of it fitting um, fitting me perfectly but the fact is that is the law that is the law of physics that is going to fit you perfectly because there is gravity because you're water and you move with the puddle you know oh. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to address some of those points, but before I do real quick, I'm going to look into our chat, and I see that someone says, uh, kids don't want to see their miserable parents from their jobs, so why bring them into the world except for selfish reasons? Well, well that brings me back to, to my other point, is that, you know, this person in, in the chat is complaining that, you know, why bring a child into the world when they're just going to see you as a parent at your miserable job and then you know mm-hmm. come home from that miserable job and they grow up to apply for some you know miserable job but again that brings me to my original point you know uh 5 10,000 years ago there were no such thing as really careers or jobs you mm-hmm. know people were more like you know hunter gatherers mm-hmm. uh so a lot of these problems that people are are complaining about and and I complain about them myself I do think that we live in a very unnaturalistic world I mean look at us right now we're mm-hmm. on a magic device called a cell phone or a computer and we are telecommunicating from across the world if you and i got into a time machine mm-hmm. even just 200 years ago and we showed the people this device they would go crazy and say like who is this magic person you know right. so, so i i think that the anti natalism sort of i guess if you want to call it movement or philosophy does have a lot of uh, merits to it and and I do see why it's getting popular because we live in an unsustainable society. Right. But now going back to your point about a woman who's pregnant and the fetus is just a a clump of cells. Well, I I could argue that we're all clumps of cells uh, essentially, but the difference between us and an embryo 
is that, you know, we have a conscious. We're able to make decisions and rationalize and we can feel pain and all these sort of things. But yeah. that, st that still poses a problem. How can you be against being born because you didn't get any consent and you weren't even a clump of cells at this point. You're just someone's thought mm -hmm. that's somehow immoral, but killing something that, that is actually at least somewhat or partially created mm -hmm. and it's going to eventually lead into something that has consciousness. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, well, you know, even though it's attached to a woman, it is still something that is uh, attached to a conscious mm -hmm. or, or moreover in another example, if someone is, is brain dead, all right. Mm -hmm. And they're in a hospital, they have no conscious, but we can't just walk up and just murder them. They have to have either a, a written will or the, the, the family has to have pre-written uh, permission because right. even though that, that body has no conscious, it's mm -hmm. still, a living organism that is attached to a conscious or if you're religious, a soul, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you reconcile all of those things, which on the surface seem to have some contradictions? Okay. So uh, firstly, firstly, these are all concepts. Okay. And, and uh, concepts can be debated endlessly. What is right? What is wrong? Okay. What's glad the, you said that. I, I'm, I'm going to bring that up again <laughs> in, in a second. But I'm glad you. So, so say that again. What you just said. I'm sorry. So basically, these are all concepts. Okay. And concepts can be debated endlessly. That's a fact. Uh, in the sense of what, uh, wh why are you saying that this person is conscious and why should we save him? Nature doesn't believe that. You are essentially the fact is that you are going against the laws of nature. Nature is very clear. If you are strong, you survive. Okay. If you are weak, if you are. Uh, uh, like a, a female lioness, right? A, sorry, a lioness will abandon her weak child. That's a fact. If he's handicapped, she'll abandon him. Okay, why is that? Because she's actually in, inadvertently trying to reduce his suffering. If you can't survive in the wild, why should I take care of you, endanger all my other kids, endanger myself, okay? Whereas when you can just die and be free from this nonsense, you know? So that is how nature works. Nature, in her, by by her very nature is against suffering. She's like survive or get out. You, you, you get a hurt for a very small amount of time in nature because the time between hurt and death is very less. We are the ones who prolong it saying that we are living beings. We are living beings. But if you are living beings, well, why don't you reduce the suffering? Why don't you have that empathy to say that the guy is suffering? Just let him go. You know? All right. Well, you said that this is against nature mm. and now, I, a, as a martial artist or as a boxer and someone who grew up in a, in a really rough neighborhood, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I don't know this might be hard for some people to believe, you know, because I'm, I'm a white guy in America, but <laughs> I was a minority. I was a minority in my neighborhood. I grew up in a neighborhood that was, that was mostly black and Asian. Um, and yes, I understand especially whenever you're getting picked on or you're in a really rough neighborhood, it is a uh, kill or be killed. I have people, you know, I have seen people get stabbed, shot. Uh, if you walk through life looking weak, you become mm -hmm. a target to predators or so-called alpha males or anyone who is perceiving themselves to be stronger than you. So I understand that that mindset of survival and you have to look out for yourself and, mm -hmm. and be strong. And I understand and I, and I greatly respect the principles of nature. And even though we live in this modern society, we mm -hmm. still have those primitive parts of our brains that whenever we see each other, we size each other up, right? Because mm -hmm. for thousands of years, we, we uh, got involved in tribal wars and mm -hmm. we had to kill each other sometimes for the sake of, of survival. But mm -hmm. whenever you invoke things being unnatural or against nature or, or, you know, these kind of things not syncing up naturally, you know, th then how do you feel about, you know, homosexuality? You know, if a homosexual couple engages, you know, in sex, there's absolutely no way that a child can be born. So mm -hmm. are you against homosexuality? No, not at all. Why would I be against homosexuality? In fact, homosexuality is very natural. Uh, there are more than five, five to 600 known species of animals that engage in homosexuality. It's just a... I'm, 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 I'm talking about just for the human species. 
No, not at all. Why would I? There, there's no reason. In fact, I'm completely pro homosexuality in the sense of that they'll never have a child. You know, <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, well, that, that that wouldn't make sense for you, right? That that wouldn't make sense because you know, naturally speaking, no homosexual can have a child. So mm-hmm. they're pretty much the top proponents and practitioners of of antinatalism. Absolutely, you know? I've always said that. <laughs> but but now I, I want to bring up another argument. Okay. Mm-hmm. about um you being born you say that it's wrong essentially mm-hmm. because it's impossible to ask a potential life for consent even though mm-hmm. those parents are the ones creating that that brain right. that leads to consent and right. that creates some sort of philosophical problems that can't really be fully solved mm-hmm. well, but you would agree that it's wrong right to to bring a child into the world without their consent you agree that that's wrong correct 100% yes okay How, you know without there being an objective reality right mm-hmm. a a timeless spaceless endless permanent creator or a god which mm-hmm. people use religion specifically monotheistic religions mm-hmm. to derive that sense of permanent morality mm-hmm. and that has been invoked in society for thousands of years and, and this is one of my big problems with with uh, atheists is that mm-hmm. they say you know religion is bad and all these bad things came from it uh mm-hmm. and there's nothing good about it mm-hmm. but wouldn't you agree that religion has at least given us some sort of solidified concept of good and evil because without a god Mm-hmm. then everything is sort of just subjective and just survival of the fittest so if there is no god and there is no objective morality mm-hmm. and everything's just survival of the fittest then why is it wrong to kill to rape uh, to steal from other people if it helps your survival well uh, frankly there was a world where it wasn't wrong okay and it it still happens among the animals uh kill rape steal it all happens like we assume that the natural world is a very beautiful place it's not it's absolutely not and uh they <laughs> they have a sense uh, they have no sense of right and wrong it's what we have created is to create a larger society and i still believe uh, that most things are like everything is there is no objective morality but the reason we have created objective morality is when humans got conscious right um consciousness was essentially uh, i i believe that the the way the bible has put it at least is that when uh, eve ate the apple she felt shame okay she became conscious of herself when she became conscious of herself in a way she was going away from uh, nature she was going towards humanity in a way okay and um then she gave it to uh, adam and he also felt the same things and then they also felt then the, the whole concept of seven sins and all that and they were thrown out of the garden of eden so basically all all these are just uh, they're just uh, representations of how we became conscious and consciousness has to have morality because otherwise we are will be confused between the animal nature and uh, the our our own very nature right so uh, and most people don't understand this concept so you have to tell them don't murder your neighbor don't sleep with your neighbor's wife you know stuff like that you have to tell them that because people don't understand you know so it's just a way morality is just a way of making even religion initially it began with mysticism and it ended up in politics that was always bound to happen because after the first five people who understand what jesus was saying the next 50 are not going to get it you know and jesus does not have the time to sit and explain to them so he's like don't murder people like just don't do bad things so that society can survive you know yeah you know and i i'm glad that even though you do consider yourself an atheist uh or an agnostic atheist that you are sort of giving some some credit to religion and and I'm very happy to 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 see you do that because a lot of people take for granted that yes even though uh there had been wars fought in the name of religion and people have have used it as a way to wield power over others mm-hmm. I'm glad that you're agreeing that you're agreeing with me that it has been something of a moral scaffolding for society where before there were modern governments before there were you know police and all these different things uh, human accountability systems mm-hmm. that religion was sort of a way to okay there's this god there's this overseeing force 
Mm-hmm. And if you do these certain things, then there's going to be a punishment, whether it's going to hell or in Hinduism or Buddhism, mm-hmm. a bad karma is going to come back around you. So right. I, you're, you're probably the first atheist that has admitted to me that there have been some good things that have came out of religion. I'm very surprised to, to, sort of, to see you sort of speak okay. about the, the, the name of uh, Jesus in a positive light that really took me for surprise. And that just goes to show you that, um, you, you know, you shouldn't always judge someone prematurely and we should have these kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. No, because I'll tell you about one thing. Uh, atheists, most atheists have not even thought about it. Uh, they are looking at religion in a very like, you know, as a child, I was indoctrinated. Now I'm not going to do it. I, I don't agree with that. Mm-hmm. Everything has a long answer. Okay, and I and I put it out. I've said if it's not a long answer, it's normally the wrong answer. So uh, it's like uh, you. Ha- <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so um, that that's what uh, they 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 just say they just ignore it. My question is, if someone is going to a church and feeling something, okay, go and study it. If you're an atheist, if you're a scientist, go and study it. You know, uh, um, put some experiments out there, try and prove it. Okay, or disprove it, whatever. But don't ignore it. There is no li- part of life that you should ignore. That is just ridiculous. Because you're then, if you're, you may, you're probably ignoring an entire dimension, you know, that you don't know about. So, but uh, when it comes to religion, I tell you, it began. What I believe is that it began with mysticism. Okay, where uh, a Jesus or a Muhammad or a Buddha or anyone, uh, they 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 realize the truth about themselves, and they just went and told people the truth. Okay, because what happens is when when religion says do not murder, okay, like someone like a Buddha may not feel like murdering someone because he has realized the truth. He doesn't care about murder, but what he interpreted it as, that, oh, do not murder. You understand? So that is what happened. Like that is what uh, it became. Later became politics, and then of course um, leaders had to had to keep that politics alive because they were trying to explain to people, but then someone tried to kill them, someone tried to murder them, someone tried to uh, create war against them. Or, you know, or Jesus got crucified, whatever. Jesus probably didn't care. He was like, I don't care. Like, I've, I've realized the truth. You can do whatever you want to me. So it's just that, that it began with mysticism, okay, became religion and ended up in politics. That is the truth of anything. Like, if yeah. I, uh, maybe Neil Anand hunted down years down the line, if humanity survives, we'll also become some sort of a religion. Who knows? You know, I don't well, want well, it. Well, but- yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't realize that the government is set up just like a church. You know, you, you have, uh, instead of a, a a head priest, you have a president or a prime minister, mm. and then instead of a a congress or a parliament in the mm-hmm. church, you have what we call uh, you know deacons mm-hmm. and or bishops. And then mm-hmm. instead of having an IRS or tax collectors, you have people passing around offering plates in the church, you know, right. to to support it financially. Mm-hmm. And then you know we we have all these rules and, and a constitution. But in the church, we have a Bible or the Ten Commandments. So right. even our modern governments are modeled after religious institutions because religious institutions were the original governments. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't want to give credit uh, to that. But going back to our original point, I, I, I think we kind of you know skimmed over a few things mm-hmm. here, is that you were talking about nature mm-hmm. and inherent, inherently – there is no morality. It's all subjective. Uh, at least from man's perspective, I am a religious person. I do believe in a, in, in a single pointed God. Uh, people talk about the big bang who pulled the trigger. I think God pulled the trigger and caused the bang. But um, uh, going back to this point is that yes, morality, if you separate it from God and you just mm-hmm. put it in human hands, it is subjective and here's a really good example. Whenever I was a kid, and I'm in my early 30s, whenever mm-hmm. I was a child, if you met an older adult and you didn't say yes, ma'am, or no, mm-hmm. sir, if you didn't use these pronouns of yes, sir, no, sir, if you didn't right. use these pronouns, you were considered a rude child. But right. nowadays, in 2021, if I say yes, sir, mm-hmm. people get mad and, and they say, why did you <laughs> assume my gender? Right. And I'm right. like, wait a second, you know, mm-hmm. 10 or 15 years ago, I, I was this doing was the, the right norm. thing. Yeah. <laughs> na- na- now, now it's the wrong thing to say, yes, sir. No, sir. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, I- I've even gotten in trouble with people uh, whenever, you know, a couple of years ago uh, working uh, 
a, a, a side gig in the service industry. Mm -hmm. I would meet people, especially whenever I worked in sales and I would say, Hey, you know, good morning, sir. Or how are you doing, ma'am? And especially here in the West, things in the West, we don't really have tradition anymore. Everything has gone right. in a million different directions. Uh, we are a multicultural society. We have Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, everybody living right next to each other on the same street. No <laughs> one can agree on anything. Um, and maybe that's a whole separate conversation about the pros and cons of, of multiculturalism and, and diversity. But, right. um, but yeah, morality is subjective when it comes to human hands. And a lot of people don't want to admit that because I just gave you a prime example of saying, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No, sir. That that was considered polite. Whenever I was a kid, if if you said yes, sir, or no, sir, people yeah. were very impressed. <laughs> people people were very impressed, and they would say, "Wow, he is such a well raised child." Mm -hmm. But now, whenever you say that, you're considered a rude, bigoted, uh, racist. Like all kinds of things get said to you if you assume someone's gender. So, getting to my main point, I'm babbling a little bit. I apologize, mm -hmm. but. If morality is ultimately subjective, as it is in, in nature, what you're saying, then how do you – doesn't that dismantle your entire argument of it was wrong that your parents gave birth to you? Because oh, there is no morality. There is no morality. So why does it matter if they gave birth to you if there's right, right. inherently so my, my no right entire, or wrong? My entire argument was essentially in the context of morality. Okay, so my when I when I debate with people, right? I'm like, what do you, first? I want to know what you believe, and then depending on your beliefs, okay, I will I will put out the argument because I'm trying to essentially mm. when we argue, we are trying to prove uh, we are you, the other one is a hypocrite, right? So I don't uh, like I'm only doing it from a, a legal standpoint. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call you. I, I, you know, please don't put a, a word in my mouth because now, now I know a lot of people. Probably most people think that way. But I, I would I would contend that we're all hypocrites in our ideology. I, I've never met someone who was a hundred percent content in mm -hmm. their beliefs because me me myself I have played with a lot of different religions, but I, mm -hmm. I came back to my my roots in Judeo Christianity. I don't okay. necessarily uh, subscribe to modern day Christianity. I have some problems with it. I'm more in right, the right, Hebrew right. move uh, mm -hmm. the, the Hebrew roots movement or Messianic Judaism, but it's pretty much all the same, just minor differences. But mm -hmm. according to the scriptures, um, I'm not supposed to work or do anything on these on this Shabbat or the Sabbath mm -hmm. day, which I occasionally break that rule. I, I try to take Saturdays off and not do anything, but sometimes I end up working anyways because I need money. Um, okay. According to according to the scriptures, I'm supposed to. Uh, not eat pork. And sometimes I do break that rule, not paying attention, or maybe I'm very hungry and that's all mm -hmm. I have available and I, and I go eat it. So sometimes I'm a hypocrite and I break my own religious rules for my own comfort, for oh, my own my convenience. Point, yeah, yeah, of course. But my whole point here is that uh, like it's to go beyond hypocrisy in the sense of be so flexible okay, to do everything that, that you cannot be called a hypocrite because you're just open to new ideas. Okay, and that that is why that is the main reason that I use someone else's morality on them when I'm debating because I don't have any literally. You know, I'm willing to examine God. I'm willing to examine religion. I'm willing to examine every damn thing that is. I'm willing to examine a natalist point of view also. I just haven't found one that makes sense to me moral uh, morally. Speaking. Mm. Oh, oh, okay. Well, before I lose my train of thought, I have two points for you. Is first off. Uh, would you be willing to change because it seems like that you're so flexible and, and open to you know new ideas and you're in a constant say, state of searching for truth. Would mm -hmm. you be willing to go the opposite way and say, yes, I believe in God. I'm a religious person or I'm no longer against having children. If you were prevented or, or I'm sorry, if you were presented with new information to prove you of the contrary. Would you Absolutely. be open to that scenario? Absolutely. There is no question about it. See, uh, when it comes to God, okay, I'd have to experience it in the sense of what you're talking about in the new information. I'd have to experience it. So the experience of God is uh, should only be that I've experienced it. I don't believe the belief will stop you from something else in the sense of 
if god actually appears in front of you and you are like no 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 i believe in jesus you know you are stopping the experience of god himself you know so that belief itself is killing you so i'd i'd never believe in anything but i can i can make arguments so even if even if there is a beautiful natalist standpoint you know uh, i i can yeah I, i totally go towards it i don't mind but i need to hear it so so in in, in a way and, and i apologize if it sounds like i'm putting words in your mouth but mm-hmm. in a way it it almost sounds like you, by saying that Mm-hmm. that you don't believe in anything that you're saying and you're almost like just being a troll just for the sake of entertainment because no. everything is and ha huh, okay uh, so uh, yeah that that's what it seems like but uh, if you if you dig deeper okay i i have one my major point here is suffering why we are constantly suffering at some point of view and it's just not worth the entire thing right i'm not even making a moral argument here. i'm just saying it's not worth it if most people are unhappy well, whereas the goal is to be happy right if the goal was to be unhappy that's fine but it, most people are unhappy most people are suffering so why why would you uh, suffer and suffering is real it's not even a moral issue i feel the pain right i feel the this so if someone can make an argument that does not involve suffering where you know uh, like i don't i've never heard an argument like that i don't think it's possible but i'm open to the idea that's another thing but i know where i stand that's there two two different things Well, well, I'm a really big fan of uh, of Sadhguru. Have you ever heard of this man? Yes, yes, of course. Y- yes, he, you know, he's. I really love some of his lectures. But he had this quote where he said, "If your stomach is empty, mm-hmm. you have a million problems. Mm-hmm. But the moment that your stomach no, is problem. full of food, yeah, one problem. If you have a million, are, are, yeah, 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 yes. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I totally butchered that. Yes, yeah. if your stomach is empty and you're hungry." you're mm-hmm. only thinking about one thing i need to eat or i'm going to die right but as soon as but as soon as your stomach is full of food mm-hmm. suddenly you're worried about your career your your girlfriend w- what kind of clothes am i going to wear mm-hmm. w- once we satisfy our basic human needs mm-hmm. then suddenly our minds become obsessed with all these possibilities that really are not necessary to our survival you know right. so I think in some ways because I have looked at data of suicide rates and mm-hmm. I was very surprised to find that poor religious countries mm-hmm. have some of the the lowest suicide rates and and you would think that in very poor countries the suicide rates would be higher but I found in these in these poor countries they mm-hmm. have this thing called the happy the happiness index mm-hmm. and the poor countries actually score higher not always but but more than developed nations they score higher on the happiness index and the only thing that i could come up with throughout mm-hmm. my travels and just being friends that come from so called third world countries and i say that with air quotes because right. who are we to say you know what That's is it. first world and what's third world you know it, it's all subjective but right. in these so called poor countries they are satisfied with less you know mm-hmm. like for example i have a lot of friends that are from the philippines mm-hmm. which is one of the poorest countries you know out there mm-hmm. and they struggle so much you know just to get basic necessities in some parts of the country they do have some rich parts but right. in western nations or modern developed nations mm-hmm. we're not happy unless we have an iphone and a car and a big house i mean i i know so many people that if their cell phone battery dies because they forgot to charge it their whole day is ruined mhm mm-hmm. so do you think do you think that in some ways that we're unhappy especially in these modern societies where careers are so important and everything's mm-hmm. driven by money and 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 status and all these things that it brings me yeah. back to a quote from the bible king solomon he wrote mm-hmm. two books in the bible that are my absolute favorite books which is the book of proverbs and the book of ecclesiastes okay which if you haven't read if you haven't read ecclesiastes i really hope that you do because it sort of has this 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 nihilistic sort of thing yeah. to it that every uh, everything's pointless the, but the luckiest that, man is he who hasn't seen the evil under the sun i think ecclesiastes that's one of his quotes something like the, but he has a quote in ecclesiastes where he says those who increase their knowledge mm-hmm. increase their sorrow 
So mm. you, 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 you are a business executive. So I assume that you earn a decent salary. You're obviously not homeless. Mm -hmm. So beca because you have this homeostasis, because you, you, you have this level of comfort, you have a lot more free time to think than someone who's homeless or poor yeah. or struggling to survive. Mm -hmm. So I think in more developed countries or people that have higher education or higher salaries, yeah. they, tend, they, they tend to be more depressed and more suicidal because they have more free time to think. So right. it sort of goes back to what you were saying about, uh, I was watching one of your videos last night about mm -hmm. you saw this bird on a windowsill who was going crazy and mm -hmm. like shaking its head and, and looking for a predator, mm -hmm. even though nothing was attacking it, because right. that is the condition that it was used to being in. Right. So, so that is basically the human condition. So that is see, that is the uh, solution for what you just said. In the sense, pe the first thing is awareness. So someone in the U.S. suppose, okay, has five million dollars, but he's not aware of his basic body and his basic mind. He thinks the Maserati, the cows, the everything that he's got is is you know is achievement, and he needs to achieve more. But at a very deep level, his mind is still searching for predators. So it's still thinking about the money that he may be losing about, you know, how to make his next dollar because that is the state of his mind. So the entire game here is about awareness. So poor people do not have the time to be aware. In fact, they are more uh, satisfied because they are trying to get to that baseline level and just having that call exactly. satisfies that very important, very deep part of your animal brain, which says you need to keep fighting. Okay. And when you reach that, then you're like, now what? So according, uh, Yuval Noah Harari says that the whole problem began, I think someone also commented here, that the whole problem began in the agricultural age. When we had excess food, we are like, now what? Now what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, there's enough. So th this is, so we are, the whole problem here is awareness. It's all about awareness. You can have a lot, you can have money, but if you're not aware of your basic bodily functions, or if you're not at least trying to find out, you know, most people, I don't care if you're aware, so at least try and find out. At least learn new things about yourself, you know, and when you learn that itself will get you more and more conscious. So you then there will be a point where you will be satisfied with the right amount of money. There are some people who just chill their entire lives and they're not on drugs. You see, so these people who are, how do they work? Because they are slightly more evolved. They understand how things work. They're more like, okay, this is just life and let it go. Let life, let's enjoy life, you know, so that, that has not been achieved by the West yet. And that will never be achieved probably by Philippines because they are kept in poverty for whatever reason. So that these are this is your paradox here. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, I do think that people ask me all the time, "What is the purpose of life?" And and, and you know, I would rather have a long conversation like what we're having, but I oftentimes give them this very short and sweet answer, and I say. The purpose of life is to give purpose to life. <laughs> and and, I, and <laughs> I, I think that that's what most people are doing. Uh, for example, whenever the pandemic first happened, I'm not sure about in India, but here in the United States, the government was paying people to stay home. They mm -hmm. were giving them all of this money. They were printing it up. Right. Now, now we're actually suffering from it because of inflation. Mm -hmm. the, the price of everything's going up. And, and I knew that this was going to happen, but, you know, no one likes to listen. Everyone was enjoying the free money while it was coming, but now yeah. there's consequences. But alcoholism went up. Depression mm -hmm. went up. Suicide rates went up because even though people were getting all this money, some were even being paid more than they were at their jobs to just stay home. After a while, the people got depressed because now their lives had no meaning. They had no job to go mm -hmm. to. They, they they had no function in society. And I do think that you make a fair point, or even as, you know, Sadhguru was saying, you know, we mentioned him, is that I think that this modern society, the consequence of it is, even though it does offer us uh, innovation and technology and so-called advancement in material life, right. uh, spiritually speaking or emotionally speaking, I think that we have regressed you know, thousands of years mm -hmm. because we have, we have lost these uh, core principles of what it means to be a part of a community without having to offer something. 
in yeah, return it's not even, to be it's a not part of that community. You see, uh, what you what you talk about as core principle is essentially a, a form of animalism, right? Uh, so people say we are pack animals and uh, we need to go right, out and we need are... to meet people. But the problem here is that we are uh, taking this animalism and making it the center of our lives. What we need is more consciousness. And as we uh, and you have the option, you know, most humans with normal brain proportions have the options for co- option for consciousness as Americans definitely do. Uh, so you're saying that, you know, people was unhappy during the pandemic, even though they had all this money and all the problem with the US is they had um, they had uh, formed an entire culture on distraction. Okay, you're constantly distracting yourself. They're going to your job, then you're coming back. That's a major distraction. Then the wife is waiting for you. She's also she's also probably finished her job. She's made some food. And then you'll watch Netflix together. And then you'll play with the kids. And then again, you'll watch Netflix together. Now the problem was that you've made the food. You've watched the Netflix. You, you've taken care of the kids. Now what? You know, what is taking about up eight hours of your day? And how do you, uh, they don't even know how to talk with themselves. You know, where am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing something? Which is why I, I think uh, this great resignation is happening. You know, the where people have finally at some level questioned themselves. Some awareness has come. And they're like, now I don't want to do this job. Whether I starve, whether I die, it does not matter. You know, and I do have the money. It's not like Americans don't have the money. So they can afford it through debt or whatever, but they can afford it and they can get better jobs. They can get, you know. So uh, in a way, this lack of doing anything has caused some level of awareness. Of course, there are going to be victims to it. There are going to be suicides. There are going to be alcoholics, or uh, drug addicts, whatever. There are always victims to every new movement. But this right, movement right. has to be one that one of awareness. You know, that's that's what I believe. Well, you know, I I wrote this book. It's called the Ninja Mindset. Awakening the warrior within it's kind of this cheesy name, but you know, I like (laughs) martial arts, so whatever, but I've experienced homelessness twice in my life. And those moments taught me a lot about survival. And I really uh, empathize with what you're bringing up about not being happy with homeostasis because each time that I worked myself out of homelessness and, I got me my own personal vehicle. I, I found somewhere to live and stay and got me, you know, a new job. Right. It, it would take me months to sort of deconstruct myself and be okay with being comfortable because mm. whenever you're homeless, whenever you're homeless, you have to worry about the police saying, Hey, you can't sleep here. We're going to arrest you or someone trying to hurt you while you're sleeping or, asking people for money because you don't have any food to eat and you're just in this constant fight or flight mode. But then once you find yourself being comfortable and safe, you're like looking around for problems that don't even exist. Mm. You're like that. bird. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But that day, and I'm actually coming up on the one year anniversary in about three weeks But the day that I got shot by that gun, it really made me a braver person. And it made me realize the fragility of life. It doesn't matter if you're young and strong. You can slip and fall and hit your head and just die just like that. So what the hell are you waiting for? If you want to ask that girl out on a date, go ask her. What are you afraid of? (laughs) you, You are going to die anyways. And whenever you die after, you know, a couple of months, a couple of years, maybe if you're really famous, people will remember you for a decade, but eventually you are going to be forgotten. So what the hell are you afraid of? Whatever it is you want to do, go out there and do it. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite philosophers is Miyamoto Musashi. Have you ever heard of this guy? Yes, I have. Oh, and my favorite quote by him. uh, Samurai, right? Yes, and he wrote the book, The Dakota, or The Mm -hmm. Art of Walking Alone. Mm -hmm. And one of his most powerful quotes that that I especially take as a martial artist and as a boxer, he said, the way of the warrior is the absolute, resolute acceptance of death. If you Mm -hmm. ever want to be successful, if you ever want to be successful in any endeavor, you have to go into it with the mindset that no matter what, you're, you're going to die. And you have to be okay with that. And, and I think the problem, and maybe this is something that you and I can agree on, is that in this society, we're always talking about life. You know, mm-hmm. 
How can I be fed? You know, how can I live? But we never talk about the art of dying Absolutely. and the value, the value that, that death gives to life because, you know, I know that as an antinatalist or as an atheist, you know, you can argue that life has no inherent value, but eventually as we develop relationships, you know, we, we build some sort of value for ourselves. But the only reason that you can build any value in this life is because of the fact that it is going to eventually end and we're going to die. So Absolutely. tell me your, so, so, so tell me your thoughts on, you know, we, we talk about, you know, life and all these principles. Mm -hmm. What is your principle on death? And mm -hmm. what value do you give to that, to the art of dying? Right. So I think death is everything in the sense of you're not even living. This body is a ticking time bomb. You're dying. Okay. So the, you're literally dying. You're decaying, you know, slowly, slowly as you get older. So the point when, when people constantly talk about life and living and hope, I'm like, hope and all is fine. I, I, I believe hope is a vice. That's another topic. But, uh, you have to just look at things the way they are. Oh my God, I think electricity is gone. Just a second. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's it. So life has to be, um, you know, life has to be constantly with that uh, thing of death in mind. Constantly watching that, okay, death is coming, death is coming. And that is what makes life worth living. Many, many, many uh, advantages. Like, you know, uh, you, you start, you do what you require. You do what is needed. You realize that you will be forgotten. You know, and even and then all these concepts like being remembered, it's a concept. Success, it's a concept. Or uh, and most people assume that they're going to live forever. Like they don't even think about death. That is an assumption that you're going to live forever. So that itself is a concept. So all these concepts, one by one, they die out. And when you live life without concept, life is miraculous. Like it is going to be beautiful. You know, but at the moment you add concepts to it, oh, I can't do this. I may do this. You know, all this nonsense. Uh, you uh, you're just filling it with nonsense that should not be there. You know, the only thing, the only reality is death. Well, I actually want to share something with you here. Just a moment. This is uh, a small, very, very small book that I wrote. It's called Removing the Sting of Death. Okay. And nice. this entire, it's only like 20 pages long, but this entire manifesto, mm -hmm. I wrote this in a, in a, in a single night. Uh, mm -hmm. about two months ago, mm -hmm. my grandmother, she was in the hospital, essentially dying from blood clots. Right. And I was sitting there thinking about her. Mm -hmm. And like I said, a year ago, a bullet scrap, you know, scraped right. the back right. of my head. And it sort of just dawned on me, mm -hmm. this notion of death. And I went to my computer and my hands just started moving and they wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And this is what came out. But I would say that the notion of death and the fact that it is creeping up, you know, behind us, doesn't that give you some sort of extra motivation to sort of explore the possibility of an afterlife? Yes, yes. But uh, before you go for an afterlife or the ex before the exploration of an afterlife, you have to first explore this life, you know, without knowing this, this machine, how firstly, how this machine works, uh, which is the body, then how the mind works then how they work in tandem. Okay. And I'm not talking about scientifically. Science is a part of it. Uh, it's a part that where you, where you read, where you understand yourself. Okay. And then they, then talking about it, debating though, that's philosophically and then understanding it. Like when you're sitting, when you meditate, when you're yourself, the whole, everyone is talking, the whole universe is talking to you. Okay. And people don't believe this, but, uh, and some people believe it. Some people don't, whatever. But the thing is, it's true. You all, what is instinct? What is gut? Every your whole body is taking in information constantly. It's throwing out information constantly. So you know this. You know how these things. So uh, you, the only first thing you have to do is realize this life. Once this life is sorted, then afterlife and all is just it's like child's play. You know, then you then you'll understand these things eventually. Once you've developed a system of understanding, you'll eventually get to the afterlife. Well, a lot of people ask me. They say. Can you prove an afterlife? And I actually can. Now, mm -hmm. now, now, before before anyone says, wait, is this guy crazy? Mm -hmm. There is an afterlife. After you die, there is a life that continues okay. on. Mm -hmm. Even in, in the, I'm talking about this world. Yeah, After it may you not die, be your there, life, there, but life continues. Right. 
R right. So after you die, there is an afterlife. It's called mm -hmm. the future. Right. But at the very least, I think that we should all be writing notes on the wall of life. And that's what we're doing right now because, you know, my name is Randall Stroud. And guess what? I'm going to die. Raphael mm -hmm. Samuel, he's mm -hmm. going to die. But this video very well may live on in the future for hundreds of years. Who knows? You know, right. m maybe maybe 500 years in the future, if, if we're still here on this earth, if there still is an earth, there may be some futuristic generation that is watching the debate between Randall Stroud and Raphael Samuel as a case study. Okay. Who knows? Right. So my point is, is that while we are here, shouldn't we be taking every effort to carve something into this wall of existence and leave notes behind for the future generations that, Hey, like it or not, there are going to be more children being born. So doesn't that give you motivation to help others to serve humanity and to give some sort of purpose to your life instead of just saying, well, it's all pointless and meaningless. And, and right. I, I don't like this existence. Does that notion or does that thought give you any sort of motivation to bring mm, smiles that, to others? That in faces? itself does not get, get me, give me motivation. Uh, it's, it's more like, um, you know, when, when I started Neil Anand and all, I, I was wondering why I did it. It just sort of happened. And I realized that if the intensity of self-discovery is strong enough, right, you will automatically leave, leave a mark. You will automatically leave a mark. So when, even when I had 20 followers and 50 followers, right, I used to assume that I'm talking to 20,000 people anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, in my initial yeah. videos, I used to have this attitude, like, you know, I'm God. And I used to ask the guy to shoot from below so that, you know, people think I'm sort of that. It's, but I did not have an ego about it. I just wanted to talk and I was just having fun in that moment. More than anything, it was self-discovery. So when that self-discovery, like if you are, if you are discovering uh, yourself, right, and in you, you end up writing a book, you end up giving a speech, you end up talking, you end up, you know, doing stuff, automatically you will leave a mark. Um, I believe that most people who um, were really like most people who are truly we remember today, okay, like Jesus, for example, they did not want to leave a mark. They just wanted to talk and their existence itself, the intensity of their self-discovery itself was so crazy that people could not ignore it. So don't try and impress people. Just discover yourself and automatically people will not be able to resist it. Yeah. It and that, that's being genuine, you know, uh, just like a, a salesperson. If you come up to someone and you say, hey, buy this product and I promise that it's going to change your life, people kind of, you know, back away. But if you're just authentic mm -hmm. and you come across genuine, people are going to be more interested because it seems uh, real. It seems mm -hmm. like, okay, this person's coming from a, a, a genuine place. But mm -hmm. I, I want to change topics real quick and just ask you a couple more questions. I don't, I don't want to, you know, keep you all night. But mm -hmm. after having talking, after having talked about all these different principles of morality and, and God and being born, uh, pleasure, pain, all of these topics. Right. And now that you're older. How many years ago was it whenever you initiated this lawsuit against your parents or, or is this lawsuit still ongoing? Uh, no, it happened. So I started the movement in 2019. Oh, that's when I became viral. Uh, and it, it sort of happened uh, late 2019 and it sort of fell through because obviously it was not, it did not have any legal standing. So I'm trying another this. So it's about a year and a half or uh, two years. So, so it's been about two years mm -hmm. since this completed. Right. Okay. If you could get into a time machine and travel back to the initiation of this lawsuit mm -hmm. with, because, because I'm going to assume that in the last, you know, two years that you've had a lot of self-reflection and, and a lot of time to, to ponder and meditate. Right. Is there any part of, is there any part of you, even just 1%, of your mind or intention that regrets filing this lawsuit or wish that you went about it in a different way? Not at all. Not at all. Because uh, see, I, I believe that if, like I said, intensity of self discovery, it will only come the fame, the money, the whatever will only come at the right time. So it, for me, it did come at the right time. If I, if it had come when I had started this off, then it would have been the wrong time because I, I was not still ready. I was still not good at speaking, etc. I was still, 
readying myself. But when I was ready, and when I was literally ready to give it up, I remember in uh, Jan 2019, I was like, okay, I'm done. I've said what I said. Okay, I've gained a few followers, and I'm happy. And I was sitting on a beach. I was chilling, and that's when I got the call from the reporter. And I told my partner also, the guy who shoots with me and edits with me. He he told he was like, are you sure you want to close it? And I'm like, yes. And then boom, this thing suddenly happened. So it is all about when you're ready, and when and I believe you are ready when you don't actually want it. You know, when you want it, you're not going to get it. But when you don't want it, it happens. So I won't. I don't regret anything. If that's what your main question. Is. Well, I want to ask you a a, a legal question, and I said that with air quotes because it's not it's not a real legal question. It's a hypothetical. But let's say that I kidnap somebody, right? And I gave them a gun, and I told them to go kill someone, and mm-hmm. I and I threatened this person. I said, "Go kill this person, or I'm going to hurt you." Mm. And that person went out and killed someone. Who do you think should be legally culpable? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, but definitely the person who's threatened uh, the second one. Definitely, because okay. that is mens rea, right? As you mentioned, so mens rea is all that matters, and legally culpable should be the one who threatens. So, so I, I guess applying that logic. Why not sue your grandparents? Because your grandparents are probably the ones who pressured your parents in saying, "Hey, we're in a traditional, you know, Indian society, and you're 30 years old or whatever. Why aren't you married? Why aren't you having children?" And then they give birth to you. So yeah, why not sue the, your grandparents? But my parents were adults who succumbed to it, so that it's actually they are culpable in this case. Okay, pressuring. See, pressure. There are a lot of pressures in life. Okay, that is like saying that is a, a, like a madman saying that Jesus came to me and said, "Kill this man." But who will you hold culpable, Jesus or the guy? So if the guy is uh, in in the case of this, your life is going right. So if one guy is threatening the other, saying, "Kill the third fellow," this guy's life is going. So he is threatened. So in that, he has acted in self defense. This wasn't self defense. This is not. This is not even close to self defense. It was just uh, an act of in a, in a way an act of greed. you know an act of uh, selfishness where my life will become easier in society and therefore i should have the chance so yes if well, adult people well, have one well, well how do you know i mean i really think that you're kind of trivializing it a little bit because you you're saying that oh yeah you know we all face pressure in society but you are not able to jump inside of the mind or the body of your mother and father and and perhaps perhaps there was maybe a part of them that maybe didn't want to have children but that societal pressure affects people differently you know like yeah. I, i have a lot of friends who are from korea mm-hmm. and suicide rates are very high in korea because there's such a, a strong uh, family pressure to become successful in school and career mm-hmm. and if you don't become successful some some people can't handle it and they commit suicide but other people are very mentally strong and they say well you know i'll just find some other way in life mm-hmm. but so how are you able to trivialize that that pressure when in reality you can never know how much that pressure to get married and have a child may have been on your parents from their parents right so i I'll, i'll tell you how i i'll trivialize the pressure on an educated person because education gives you a little bit of awareness right generally most education if it's if it's of a decent level and my parents have had decent education so that is the first thing they did not think things through right someone who's uneducated yes maybe i would give them a little bit of this and this entire campaign is to educate those people so if someone is educated i i totally believe and well educated and they've seen the world and they've gone abroad and they've you know experienced and spoken to people and believe in philosophies and if you've not thought the thing through then you are definitely culpable no matter how much pressure on society if they put a gun to your head that's a different thing but pressure ah <laughs> well you know president ronald reagan he once said it's funny that everyone who's arguing for abortion has mm. already been born <laughs> and a- another wise person said if you think you don't value your life let me throw you in the ocean and i'll watch you struggle to stay alive mhm so the inherent value of life is i think i think it's there mm-hmm. and i do think that you know deep down inside 
we do have a thirst or a knowledge of, of God or what God could be. Mm -hmm. But we're obviously having some disagreements, mm -hmm. but I want to, I want to bring to one final point that, that I feel that we didn't fully uh, settle mm -hmm. is the part about morality in nature. Okay. okay. You, you said that inherently there is no such thing as morality and it's just nature and it's always changing. Mm -hmm. So if we're coming from your side of the argument, like, you know, there is no God and morality is something that is subjective and it's mm -hmm. something that we evolve and create and change over time. And as you said, and I agree with you in nature, animals uh, steal, kill, they, they rape, they, mm -hmm. they, they do whatever enhances their survival. So mm -hmm. whenever you're watching television, and you see on the nightly news that someone has been killed or raped or mm -hmm. something horrible happened. Right. How, how can you say that that person should go to prison or how can you be appalled by, by such, such actions? Are you a product of indoctrination to respond to those things in a negative way or mm -hmm. deep down inside? Does it just not affect you? Very good question. So um, I live in a society, right? And in relation to this society, I, I believe in keeping this society, at least for now, I believe in keeping it. I like the idea that I'm safe. I like the idea that my uh, family is safe. Okay. And in this, uh, this, that why people shouldn't be murdered or killed or whatever, because we live in a society and it's basically society versus that person. That's all that's happening. There is no morality to it. Okay. If someone tries to kill uh, my parents or my sister or my uh, or my anyone you know my dad or anyone uh, I will go and kill them it's just that and or at least go to the law and you know complain or whatever and if that doesn't happen I'll go and kill them it's just there is no morality to it it's just the, the order of things so if you look at things as bad and if you're shocked at them you will not be able to look at them as they are and as they are currently people are safe a majority of people like society a major, majority of people want to be safe so it's just those people Versus these people. That's it. And I'm on this so, side. So, so are you trying to say or allude to the fact that inherently we all have a desire to kill, rape, steal, do all these things, but through the law, through the legal system, through and the government, through or maybe through, mm. or maybe through yeah, religion, mm -hmm. that we all just sort of have this, uh, this ceasefire agreement that, hey, even though I, I want to do all these things mm -hmm. in order to, you know, stay alive and increase the chances of survival for everyone, we're all going to agree to not do these things. But deep down inside, we all do want to do these things. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. And uh, again, here it's a problem of awareness. So what happens is uh, people ignore their animalism you know, as society grows and grows. People ignore the animalism. And I, I put up a, a status recently saying, trust people who can play with fire, not ignore it. You know, the fire is within you. The hell is within you. The heaven is within you. The God, the devil, everything is within you. You just have to be conscious of both of these things. And the problem is most people are not conscious. They suppress the devil. They suppress hell. They suppress the evil. And then it's going to come out in ugly ways because it is evil. Okay, at least evil speaking, you know, of this. And what is uh, the very, like the word sin, okay? What does the word sin mean? You can, uh, you can trace it back to the Latin word forgetfulness. So as you kill, as you do stuff, okay? You're forgetting your human nature and you are remembering your animal nature. The idea here is to go more human than animal. So that is, that is just how you look at the entire thing. Well, in the book of Mark, there's this, uh, in the Bible... There's this good exchange between, uh, in Hebrew, Yeshua, but for mm -hmm. everyone else, Jesus. Right. Jesus is being approached by a student, and he says, that the student says to, to Jesus, good master, you know, how do I get into heaven? Mm. And then Jesus corrects him, and he says, why do you call me good? None <laughs> are good but God. Exactly. You know, be, because good in relation to Jesus or God is moral perfection. Mm. And as what's stated again in, in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter six, mm -hmm. is that none are righteous, not a single one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no such thing as a good person because we have all lied, which makes us mm -hmm. liars. Right. We have all 
stolen something, even if it's just an ink pen or a pencil, that makes us thieves. Mm -hmm. People say, wait, wait a second. Just because I stole a piece of candy once when I was a child, that makes me an eternal thief. In a sense, it kind of does. If, if you rape a woman or you kill someone, you're known as a murderer or a rapist your entire life as well. Mm -hmm. So by doing something that is quote unquote evil or, or bad one time proves that you have the capability to do it again under the right circumstances. Right. So, so that is my sort of motivation and my admiration for religious practices or even as what we're doing now, just having this conversation, philosophical discussion is that we are in a constant state of trying to discipline ourselves, even if it's just going to the gym and exercising. If you skip the gym for a couple of weeks, you go right back to being fat. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a daily process of sculpting oneself. Right. Don't worry about don't worry about finding yourself. Worry about creating yourself. Mm -hmm. Let it be a conscious intention. And I do agree with you that I think that there are so many people who are just allowing life to happen to them mm -hmm. instead of actively engaging the process. Exactly. In creating I, I believe who well, they life are. is literally begging you to engage with it, which is why most people are living horrible lives. Because it's like, come out, get out of your damn shell. Come on, engage with me, you know. And you're just like, no, I'm going to sit in my train. I'm just going to, you know, go to work, get stuck in traffic. Okay, then then stay in hell. Who cares? You know? <laughs> well, well um, we're going to wrap this up here. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do want to say that uh, I am grateful that you have been born. I'm glad that you do exist so that wherever our, our souls were before this physical life mm -hmm. and we were born into these physical bodies with five senses that allow us to engage with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually glad that your parents gave birth to you because if they didn't, I don't think that I would be able to have this conversation B because of you. I was introduced to many of these questions. And even though we obviously have some disagreements and we don't mm -hmm. fully agree, uh, I think that your arguments do bring up the point that there is something wrong with society when people are, are literally saying, I can't afford to have a child. I, I, uh, I'm worried about paying my rent. Mm. These are not questions that our ancestors had. And these are not natural questions. The, the, the phrase, the cost of living, to me is morally abhorrent. And it's, <laughs> it's, sort of an, it, it, it's sort of antithetical to what it means to be a human. The cost of living. So you mean to tell me that just by breathing, just by existing, there has to be some sort of price tag behind it? So mm. I, don't, I don't find a problem with creating life. I'm not an antinatalist. I do believe in God. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am glad that you were born, but I will concede with you that there is something sick in our modern society when people are being hesitant about starting a family or getting married because they're worried about some damn price tag when money itself is a modern invention. <laughs> no, that's another it's something, yeah. so, so, something, something artificial controls mm something that is naturalistic. Mm. Those two puzzle pieces, there's a big problem. And I think that's why there's this big debate right now between capitalism and socialism and communism. Everyone is looking at society and saying, what the hell happened? And maybe this can be a future episode where, where we talk about the monetary system and we talk mm -hmm. about the economy and, and things like that, because you're right. That mm. is a whole separate yeah, monster yeah. <laughs> to... To, to unpack exactly. but um but but yeah this has been a wonderful conversation so i'm gonna let you take take the stage and give your final message to anyone who may be listening uh any any uh you know messages of hope or to summarize <laughs> things and then and then be sure to uh to plug your platforms if you've written any books how people can find you all that so you have the next uh you know two or three minutes to yourself so um all I have to say, and I've constantly been saying in north of 500 videos, is that just chill in life, you know, observe yourself. And that's all that matters. There are only two things that exist. One is the truth and one is you. When you 
eliminate yourself you will essentially become the truth and that should be, that should be the only thing the only there are only two things you can do and one is adding to your ego and subtracting to your ego try and subtract you everyone is adding to their ego every billionaire is adding every idiot who believes in concepts is adding so why try try and do something different you know try and understand how life works be free from this nonsense not just society but even from the idea of yourself and that's it <laughs> okay uh and do you have any uh books or any things that, that right. have uh, been so produced I, or is there anything that you want to promote i have two books currently uh and i've just uh, they are on this online for free uh, one is called um i forgot the name man <laughs> okay how to stop all human suffering it's on antinatalism it's about my story and antinatalism and various other stories and i mix them together and the other is called why women will never be safe uh it's about uh, gender and you know how how we interact and how there are problems and how it's going to exacerbate as climate change etc it's a lot of things it's basically about gender and how the genders work and why they work and because a lot of people don't really know so these two books are there and i'm on facebook as nihil anand uh, n i h i l a n a n d i'm also on youtube as nihil anand only this uh, on this platform i instagram i'm a nihil anand 000 the numericals and that's it yeah that's my so, so so i actually do have have one more question i i apologize and it'll be real quick mm-hmm. but rafael samuel is this your actual name or just yes. a, a moniker that you use that's my that's my actual name Oh, okay okay so yeah. if people google your name as well i'm sure that they can find all these things through just clicking links and just sort of researching as well yeah yeah i'm all over google unfortunately <laughs> okay <laughs> well m- me too you know if you google my name uh, mm-hmm. i'm i'm all out there as well but uh but like you said engage with this experience don't be afraid of, of your reputation or what might you know what others yes. may say because i'm i'm sure that there's people watching this there's some people listening to me saying like you know who the hell is this american guy mm-hmm. he, he sounds so stupid and then there may be people you know listening to you like who the heck is this anti natalist guy i don't agree with anything he, that he's saying but we don't care we're here yeah. we're having a, a a discussion and we're trading knowledge and experiences and i think that uh these kind of experiences and conversations is what enriches the human experience and uh, and it's been yeah. really fun really fun yeah same here same here. thank you so much randall for insisting i know i was uh, i was avoiding you because i was really busy but uh, i'm glad you insisted and sort of followed it through so this is really fun and we should do this again yeah and, and i'll just close by saying that there are people out there that have made fun of you mm-hmm. uh if, if you know who uh Charlemagne the god are you familiar with him the the host of uh, the breakfast club radio show no i don't know is that is that I'll, a big one i'll send you mm-hmm. yes it's huge oh, it has oh. millions of followers but he did a story on you recently really? and he didn't have a he didn't have a lot of nice things to say about you i'll actually send the link mm-hmm. but i actually don't like this radio host mm-hmm. he makes fun of a lot of people so charlemagne the god if mm. if he hears this How dare you call yourself a god first and then secondly uh I want to fight you in a boxing match okay mm-hmm. I I don't like this guy all he does is make fun of people behind the microphone <laughs> but w- why not have you on his show and actually oh. talk about it how how we're talking about it so whenever I first came across you I was like wow I don't agree with some of the things that he's saying mm. but instead of writing some article or making fun of you that's why i reached out to you because i said i want to have a conversation with this guy and hopefully after this conversation is over i'm going to walk away and and meditate on some of the things that you've said and mm-hmm. i hope that you'll do the same for some of the things that i've said definitely definitely and and that's how this world gets better i think so i'll leave it on that thank you so much thank and i uh, hope to talk to you soon thank definitely you. definitely randall thank you send me that link yeah I I definitely will in the next 5 minutes I'll I'll DM it to you. All right. All right. See you. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Okay, guys. That was Rafael Samuel. That was a very interesting conversation. My mind was going in a million different directions. There was a lot to unpack in that conversation. 
there may have been a, a few things that I wish I had brought up and said in the heat of the moment, and I'm sure that he feels the same way. A lot of times whenever you're having a conversation, you're thinking about your response and what you want to say, but then they say something else, and then your mind goes in, a, in another direction. But I feel that both of us made some really strong points, some interesting points, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you did enjoy it, maybe I'll have them on again and we'll talk more. But, yeah, that was a very interesting conversation. So for everyone who's in this live feed, thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching. Hope you enjoyed it. You know, leave a comment below. Let's continue the discussion, the conversation, and uh, hope to see you again. Subscribe, like, share, all that good stuff, and let's keep this conversation going because there are some serious problems in society right now that need to be fixed. And the only way that we can fix it is to have these tough, uncomfortable conversations. But for me personally, I didn't find it uncomfortable. It was very uh, stimulating for me. So thank you guys and have a great rest of the day.